there is a real difference between a soda and honey, between a soda and a banana, between a soda and table sugar. Well, those are actually pretty similar, but I was just doing that to see if you were paying attention. But there's a lot of people on Twitter, which I don't go on much anymore, who will say that a couple of tablespoons of honey is the same as a Coca-Cola. And that's just not the case. We really must debate. We really must push get back against calories in, calories out, zealotry. We must push back against the notion that all calories are created equal. We know from studies of seed oils that seed oils, linoleic acid-containing oils, are going to affect human physiology much differently than oils like tallow, which contains stearic acid and other odd-chain fatty acids. So all calories are not created equally in the realm of fats. All calories are not created equally in the realm of carbohydrates. A processed sugar, high fructose corn syrup, I believe there's some debate whether the glucose and fructose, which make up high fructose corn syrup, are actually together or separate. Sucrose is table sugar. That is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose together. And perhaps in high fructose corn syrup, there is some separation of those. But there is an increasing trend toward looking like the sugar in these foods, perhaps even sucrose, processed sucrose, is getting absorbed so much more quickly into the body that that could be a real problem. So perhaps that's part of the mechanisms. Perhaps it's the fact that the sugar is coming with all these other compounds that are affecting the way that we metabolize the fructose. But what is increasingly clear is that fructose from fruit is not that bad for humans at all. In fact, it might be part of a very healthy diet, like an animal-based diet, as I would argue. And there are good studies to show this. I'm going to show you a study that Rick Johnson has done specifically in his clinic, looking at a low fructose diet where they added back fruit and didn't see any problems. But we wouldn't be surprised at that. We've seen it so often clinically in people with animal-based diets. Before I get into the study with Rick Johnson and fructose added back to a low fructose diet, I want to talk for a moment about vegetables. I don't know how many new people we have listening to the podcast, but people are probably asking, Paul, why even eat fruit? Why not get my carbohydrates from white potatoes or rice or oats or wheat? Leaves, stems, roots, and seeds of plants are the most highly defended parts of plants. When I was strict carnivore and I had these electrolyte issues, I had to think about this in my mind. I had to think, what carbohydrates should I add back? Should I add back dextrose? <laughs> should I add back maple syrup? Should I add back honey, which was the first thing I tried? Should I add back strawberries or oranges or bananas? That was the next thing I tried. Should I add back squash? Should I add back sweet potatoes? Should I add back white potatoes or rice? But as I got into the grains, things like rice, wheat, corn, and I got into the roots, things like white potatoes, I was immediately reminded of all the research that I'd done showing that many of those compounds have lots of defense chemicals. White potatoes are full of defense chemicals. They're full of solanine and other alkaloids, which are problematic for humans very clearly. They also contain lectins. I think white potatoes are going to cause massive issues for humans. Why would you get your carbohydrates from that when you could get your carbohydrates from the least toxic sources, which I believe are fruit? There's good evidence in tomatoes and other fruit, yes, tomatoes are fruit, that as fruit ripens, the amount of anti-nutrients, the amount of defense chemicals in the fruit decreases. So how fascinating is this? Plants are so smart. I've heard my friend Joe Rogan talk about this, and I've talked about it on the podcast. Some plants can actually sense vibrations of nearby insects chewing on leaves and increase the amount of defense chemicals in those leaves in anticipation of an insect coming to that leaf. Plants decrease the amount of defense chemicals in fruit as it ripens because they don't want an animal to eat the fruit before it's ripe. Because when the fruit is ripe, the seeds are ready inside. The plant is putting a lot of energy into that fruit to prepare those seeds to germinate. If the animal eats the fruit too soon, the seeds are not ready to germinate, meaning that if the animal consumes the fruit, then it's going to hopefully not chew all the seeds, poop out some of the seeds in a pile of fertilizer, but the seeds are ready to germinate. So all that effort by the plant is wasted. The intention of plants is very, very clear here. They're making sweet fruit. It is very palatable. It becomes more sweet as it's ripening. And it becomes more colorful as, as it's ripening to, to signal. I have bananas in my yard here in Costa Rica. They're green. They don't look good to me. But I know that maybe in a few months, when those suckers turn yellow, it is time to eat those bananas because that banana palm is ready to tell me, hey, these bananas are ready to be eaten, Paul. But right now, if I go eat those green bananas, not a good thing. They're going to taste mealy. I'm sure there's going to be more defense chemicals. We know that in the skin of the banana, there's a lot of saponins. And I think even in an unripe banana, you're going to find more defense chemicals from the plant. They're so smart the way they interact with us. But this happens in all plant parts. It just, they don't decrease in leaves. Plants put defense chemicals in leaves like kale or spinach. They put defense chemicals in roots and stems and bark, even cinnamon, a mainstream spice. 
has things like coumarins in it, which can be problematic for humans. Why would tree bark be good for us, guys? Plants don't want you to eat that. So just think about these things. Seeds are seeds, nuts, grains, and beans. These are all things that if you plant in the ground, they will grow into a plant. They're going to be the most highly defended part of the plant. They're net very, very negative. It's not to say that you can't find one study showing that if you include beans, maybe you have a positive outcome because it's displacing something else. But why would you eat the foods of survival? Why would you eat the foods that really only starving humans eat if you have access to much better foods, much more nutrient-rich, much more bioavailable, much less toxic foods? So in my mind, as I'm thinking, which carbohydrates should I add back? Because I've learned in my journeys, in my evolution, in my continuous learning as a human, as a doctor, as a person, as a human being, that I needed carbohydrates, that I feel better with carbohydrates. Ketogenesis has benefits in some humans. I mentioned that I would talk about low-carb diets, and I will before this podcast is over. But what carbohydrates should I add back? What carbohydrates do I think you should add in? Fruit and honey. The honey should be raw. It should be dark. It should not be heated. The fruit should be real fruit. It should not be pasteurized fruit juice. It should be real fruit. You want to make orange juice? Make it fresh squeezed. I think it's probably fine. Apple juice? No bueno. And don't pasteurize the fruit juice. And don't remove the pulp from the orange juice. And don't get pasteurized orange juice. Really, I would just prefer pure fruit rather than fruit juice, but I think that even an orange juice with a pulp in it is probably fine. Maybe don't exceed one gram per kilogram of fructose in a certain setting. Don't chug a whole liter of orange juice, or if you do, make sure you follow your labs and see if that has an experiment, uh, see if that has an increase in anything that's negative, and tell me about the experiment, because we're still trying to figure this out as humans, but I don't think that we should fear fruit because it's an evolutionarily consistent food, and when we look into the data, there's so much good evidence that it's a great way to add carbohydrates for humans. And believe me, your gut, your partner, your toilet will thank you when you have less gas and bloating and you get to do one nice, dainty, polite poop a day instead of three smelly, farty poops from vegetables. And if you look at the poop, which is kind of gross, but an interesting experiment, I know you've done it, we've all done it. You'll see a lot of undigested vegetable parts when you're eating those things, but you won't see a lot of undigested fruit parts. Fruit is very digestible, as is meat. So don't ever fall prey to the notion that meat is rotting or putrefying in your stomach. That is also bullshit. 